talking today with Richard Nelson, and it's great to be talking to Ricky Nelson for my first ever on-camera Lee TV interview, so I'm enjoying this. Great to connect with you today, Richard, and uh, maybe tell the viewers how you and I first met. Sure. So I was uh, just preparing to uh, have dinner, and I got a knock at my door, and uh, I opened the door, and, and what smiling face greeted me? But Lee. And uh, you were warm and inviting, and uh, you told me why you were here to see me. And, uh, and of course, I was um, very interested in what you had to say that day. So uh, you joined us for dinner. And um, once you've, once you've uh, supped with somebody, you uh, definitely uh, feel that sort of friendship connection. And so uh, um, it, was, it was really interesting to, to meet you in that way. In those days, of course, I was with the Canadian Taxpayers Federation doing uh, work as an agent and uh, fundraising for them all over the province. So I think the person who was warm and inviting was you because not everybody's going to invite you in when you show up at lunch. So I'm very glad that you did. And uh, it's uh, look, look where life has taken us today. Lee, Richard, if anybody shows up on my door talking about low taxes, they're going to get invited in at my house. Boy, doesn't that sound good already? So tell us about, uh, some more about your background for those uh, maybe watching that uh, don't know you as well. Sure, sure. So uh, I grew up in the Battlefords area. I went to school at Connaught School um, and, and on to the, to the Comprehensive. Um, I, when I got out of high school, I actually had a dream of working in oil rig. So I went up to Lloyd Minster, like many young people my age. Uh, I worked a uh, service rig around Lloyd for a while and, until I got the opportunity to, to join SEDCO. Uh, SEDCO drilling rig number 86. And so if you, if you live in the EDAM area, you'll remember the rig well, because it's Derek was always up over the trees for, for years on end, probably 20. And of course, I was only there for a few of them, but um, I certainly enjoyed that time. Then I was able to, uh, to go back to school. And, and thanks to that, I went to the University of Saskatchewan. Um, I graduated with a degree in political science, or a degree in watching the news, as I like to call it. And uh, that brought me back home uh, to my riding eventually. I, I got into the storage industry and was able to to start my own small company from from Prongy, Saskatchewan here, just outside Cutknife. Um, so that's been a, that's been a real blessing. And now that I'm back in the riding, I've realized that um, the only challenges we ever seem to to uh, face in this riding uh, generally come from the east of us. And um, so I've I've taken a foray into federal politics and ran for the nomination in Desnethe, Missnippi, Churchill River, and. Uh, uh, while uh, Gary Vidal was successful in that nomination, uh, he's probably a great MP for that riding, and, and I wish him the best. Um, however, uh, that brought me back home to Cutknife, and, and I find that uh, we're facing many of the same challenges, and um, uh, electing a full slate of Conservative MPs from Saskatchewan hasn't changed those challenges a bit, and electing a full slate of Sask Party MLAs are nearly full. Um, it hasn't changed it either, so... Uh, I'm just frustrated and looking for a change, and, and that's what brings me uh, to politics today. Mm -hmm. I think you also ran when Jerry Ritz advocated his riding. Is that not right? Yeah, that was my very first foray into politics, and uh, and I ran in that nomination for the Battlefords Lloyd Minster in 2017, and I eventually joined that board of directors. I spent some time working with Rosemary Falk, uh, and I, I learned a lot about campaigns and, and about the state of uh of Canadian politics, both federally and provincially, because of course, you know, those are very connected, connected terms in Canada. And um, so as a confederation, uh, we're a little bit different than a republic and we all have our interests and, and we all deserve to have those interests heard. And that's, that's why we're talking today, Lee. I read your press release and I want to read a little portion here. And it said, I've been working hard for change in politics for a few years, and I give 100% to every campaign to spread the message about our exceptional province and all we have to offer. I have always believed that Ottawa could learn from us rather than forcing their egocentric logic upon Saskatchewan time and again. What is apparent to me is that our problem is not our argument for fair treatment. Rather, it is a math problem. We are ruled by city, states and provinces to the east and federal elections are decided before Manitoba's polls close. If that is not enough, the parties we elect provincially and federally always capitulate to the east, leaving the west disadvantaged and underrepresented. Now, I can't argue with that. And one of the challenges that I have is that when I talk to the interim leader before Wade Sierra, Jake Wall, 
everything he was telling me about his assessment about the relationship between the West and Ottawa, I had to admit, was absolutely true. Now, I don't have a membership in your party. I don't have any provincial memberships, but I'm really interested in your journey as someone who's been an active part of mainstream political parties who has gone over, like Jay Hill has, to represent a move for Western independence or Western separatism. So how has that evolution come about for you? Well, uh, so to that end, um, you're absolutely correct. Um, something needs to change. And so I spent many an hour um, thinking very, very seriously about that because I've always been a federalist in the past and I've always believed that there, there must be a way um, to, to foster the relationship in a, in a positive manner. Um, after the last election, it's become more apparent than ever that we are becoming more polarized rather than less polarized. So that's what got me talking. The, the new leader of the Buffalo Party. And, and he, he explained a couple of things to me very seriously, because like everybody, the very first question I had for him is, what do you mean by separation? As separatists, what's your stance? And, and he corrected me right away, and he said, look, the, the fact is this, uh, we're a confederation, which is sort of a loose federation of regions and provinces anyways, but it's secession if necessary, but not necessarily secession. So that is ways to be recognized within our confederation. Um, in, in a regional or a provincial way, that's a lot more parable than, than the current relationship we have, honestly. I don't know why political parties feel the need to speak for the, the citizens of the West and the citizens of Saskatchewan in particular. Um, why are they afraid to, to pose the question, to have a referendum? Um, I think they're scared of what they hear. And, and I think that our current political leaders are, are in for a bit of a surprise this election, that, that people are interested. Uh, they do want to hear the options. Hey, Nobody's saying we want to separate for sure. We're saying we want to explore the idea. We would like to be able to say that we have the same deal in equalization that Quebec has. Um, we have the control over our taxes and, and our income tax um, in the same way that Quebec has. These shouldn't be unattainable um, um, pipe dreams. This should be of existential importance. And, and if Quebec is a distinct nation within Canada, Certainly Saskatchewan qualifies, and possibly even a subdivision of Saskatchewan rider nation probably qualifies as well. So if that, if that is the only qualification we need to get a fair deal in Canada, then by all means, uh, we are as distinct as it gets. Well, as somebody who has been at Rough Rider Road Games in Toronto and Montreal and Ottawa, I think Rider Nation is probably bigger than the current Saskatchewan population because for many decades, our best export was our people. It has been remarkable to watch since 2007. And I think this happened probably as soon as the polls had come out in December 2006. Brad Wall and the SAS party were polling I think it was 54% support. So the writing was on the wall. Everyone knew the NDP era was coming to an end. And that's when the investment money started coming into properties and businesses. So that when Brad Wall actually took over in November of 2007, the boom was already well underway. So there has been a time of growth leading up to this time. But was there a demarcation point where you said, you know what, I think it's time for us federally and provincially to start looking at Western independence parties. Well, Lee, you put your finger right on it. Uh, you spoke to the success that Bradwell had. And, and when Bradwell started this movement, I can remember him and Ken Shoveldayoff at the University of Saskatchewan recruiting young supporters like myself uh, when I attended there. Um, what Bradwell was, was really capable of doing was creating a positive uh, vibe. And what he did was he made Saskatchewan the most economical place in all of Canada to invest and do business. And um, and you'd be surprised, but uh, you'll find out that the Buffalo Party has that exact same goal. We would like to make Saskatchewan the most economical place to invest and to do business, operate here in Saskatchewan, in all of Canada, we in all of the world. Mm -hmm. um, we would like to create a program that would help young entrepreneurs start up in the province and also young farmers. We know that that's an industry that's very prohibitive for, for anybody to start up in, but certainly a young family. They just don't have the capital financing available and farming has gotten too large too quickly. So something has to be looked at. And certainly if we want to preserve Saskatchewan, the Saskatchewan we know, the Saskatchewan we love, 
Um, that includes families on farms. And, and I'm proud to say that. I, I don't support the complete urbanization of our province. And so I would like to see more medium-sized and small-sized um, growth all over the province and not just in Saskatoon and Regina. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at what the SAS party has done or has not done, what sorts of things stand out for you? Well, um, they seem to be a party out of ideas. Uh, we we started the pre-writ campaign with a bit of an Oprah campaign. You know, they, they went from town to town and they said a school for you and a, a school for you and a school for you. And so now they've, they've got done, and, and all of this is coming from debt. This is all deficit spending, or, or it's coming from the federal government, which, again, is deficit spending. So anything that, that they're giving us right now, they're giving to us out of our own pocket. And, and now that campaign's changed a little bit now. They've got, some, they've got some tax relief, but only if you can afford to renovate your house. So if you're on CERB right now, or if you're one of the Saskatchewanians that are out of work, uh, a home rental tax credit does not help your world at all. And, and today now we, we have the rebate on, on power uh, prices. Hey, great. Maybe we should have considered regulating that a long time ago. But this has now changed to the Ebates campaign, I guess. Look, these are not the types of solutions that are going to bring new business and new growth and new energy producers into Saskatchewan. Government like we have, if we're not trying to bring the energy producers into Saskatchewan, honestly, we who is? Right. Well, if you can't stand up for yourself, who's going to stand up for you? And it's interesting. I have a friend who grew up in Quebec. I know him from my time working for the Conservative Party in 2010. That's when we met. Actually, we met at a rally that was at Parliament when Candace Hepner, uh, who at the time it was her name, brought forward that private member's bill to take rifles off of the gun registry, and it fell short by two votes, uh, mostly because there was a lot of pressure put on by Jack Layton against one of the maritime MPs, I think Peter Stauffer, who'd been always against it, and then all of, all of a sudden he had this epiphany that he was on the wrong side of the issue. So the NDP could look like they had a free vote, but they didn't. And that at that time, uh, we formed a friendship there that has lasted. And one of the things he said was he actually welcomes the West standing up for itself because he sees a lot wrong in the relationship of the federal government with Quebec, the favoritism that Quebec receives. And so even as someone who has been involved with the Conservative Party for a long time, he believes that there is something very helpful in the West standing up for itself to correct what is wrong with Quebec, actually to make the whole country win. So I find that interesting, but what do you see as the way that your party's presence in this election can forward that kind of result? What, how can you really do that? Well, so that's, that's a perfect question. You know, the fact of the matter is this. Um, this province has always, always taken part in nation building, and we're proud. We're proud Canadians. We always have been. So here we are. We sit in a province that literally has every resource anyone could need. We have water. We have food. We have energy. We have uh, potash, you know, to grow more food. Everything the whole world needs, in fact, and certainly everything Canadians need, yet Apparently, half of Canada doesn't want to use the energy we produce. Um, so if we're going to talk about nation building, then we have to talk about energy independence. Um, using our energy is not just beneficial to the environment on, a, on an ethical level. It's beneficial to the country on a national level. And if there's provinces or if there's leaders in this country that are having a hard time recognizing that being energy independent is not one of the advantages that Donald Trump uses to bash Justin Trudeau over the head, then they're not looking at it clearly. We have the key to the car. All they have to do is get in and drive. And instead, they, they don't. And they tell us that, they're, that we're crazy if, if we're being feeling alienated or resentful. It's, it's disrespectful. It's, it's a poisonous relationship. If we had it with another person, we, we would be doing something about it. But if we have it with the federal government, somehow that's okay. Um, you know me for a long time, Lee. Um, I, I have had a a small speech that I do from time to time that's called More Saskatchewan and Less Ottawa. And and there's something to be said for it. A little bit more Saskatchewan, a little bit less out of control spending, and a little bit more um, austerity. Not not cuts. And and the other side will say that right away. Oh, he's talking about cuts. I don't mean that at all. What I mean is is we are investing money into programs right now and we're using uh, COVID as the reason to 
to put money into programs with absolutely no metrics at all. We're not evaluating whether it was sex successful or not. We are just getting the money out the door, as, and we hear this in the news, and, and with absolutely no accountability. In fact, we don't want to know anything about it, because if it's not successful, we wouldn't want that to, to reflect on the government. So just take the money, run away, please. Um, 20,000 projects, where'd they go? That's the usual, that's business as usual in Ottawa. Um, and that's not the way we operate here. It's certainly not the way Regina operates. And uh, so I think we could use a little bit more Saskatchewan in all of the country. Well, it was interesting that one of the Black Box reporter people was on the John Gormley show a few weeks ago, and he said, it seems like there is a magical rainbow that circles around Montreal and keeps dropping pots of gold. So it's apparent to any uh, informed observer that there is a certain cohort, and I would dare say this is worse in uh, under a liberal government than under a conservative government, where there's uh, beneficiaries that are having personal relationships. And so we maybe that's a good segue to talk about the WE scandal. And I saw on Facebook a while ago that you had pointed out Premier Moe's lesser known connection to the WE charity and a contract for something that happened here. Yeah. And so the WE charity is a very interesting anomaly in Canadian politics. And, and as we watch them scurry away and take as many of the records as they can with them and leave Canada, it, it points out something pretty important. And, and that is that we all know that politicians have interconnections, um, you know, friends. Uh, it happens. Those things happen. And charities are exactly the type of thing that, that can cross party lines, across partisan lines. You may be involved in the Terry Fox run. Well, it doesn't matter if you're a conservative or a liberal. Terry Fox was a, was a wonderful hero, and we will all support that. So the wee scandal appears on the surface to be just that. But the more we get to find out, the, the more the connections start to look a little bit uh, problematic. So now, if I'm the premier of Saskatchewan, and I'm trying to pick where I'm going on my winter vacation. It's December, and I'm deciding, where should I go? Do I choose the place in Africa with the kids that hang out with Hillary Clinton and advertise on MTV and fly Bill Morneau and his family out to the resort for free? Or do I just pick somewhere else, right? I'm thinking I pick somewhere else. But for some reason, our premier, and unknown, we don't know how many people went along. I doubt that he went alone. I don't like to travel alone, but it's possible doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, is we don't usually get to see the trough that politicians go to. We know they go there, but the Wee scandal was the first time we got to see it. Politicians of every stripe, they were all there. Um, it doesn't even look that fun, Lee. I wouldn't have gone there. Yeah, and who knows? I mean, he says that he paid for it under his own uh, auspices, that he paid for that, and not everybody would volunteer abroad. So, it could be a suggestion that there was a philanthropic aspect to it. But at the same time, we know from the Canada land recordings that were received later that there were some very interesting phone calls going on about uh, a fraud and corruption investigation. There was some indication that some money was given to quell this. And we know what what did that exactly mean? Uh, somebody did get charged. I mean, they were part of the WE charity, but it didn't impugn the charity itself. There was a $260,000 contract that was going to bring in a WE charity program to Saskatchewan schools. And that got kiboshed in this whole thing. So it, it is an interesting sort of twist on that. And apparently... Uh, if my reading was correct, the Kielbergers or uh, one of them ha at least had met with Premier Mo back in November. So it's very interesting how that charity curried relationships with uh, people of all political parties as best they could. I think they really took the Cirque du Soleil approach, uh, which is to basically form as many friendships with as many leading business and influential people as you could and hope that they open doors later. And of course, as many of us know, the We Charity has spectacularly collapsed. The fallout and the light that was shone on that led to some changes that once the public knew what was going on, maybe they decided that their charitable dollars could best go somewhere else. Now, I know you've had an interest as well in the energy aspect of what has been going on and the provincial role in that. Do you want to speak to that a bit? Yes, yeah, certainly. So. Um, we, we heard the announcement uh, a few months back that uh, uh, the federal government had come up with money to clean up, you know, uh, abandoned wells. 
And, and on the surface, that sounds very utilitarian. Abandoned wells, they could be dangerous. They could migrate gas. There's all kinds of great reasons to, to um, abandon wells. However, um, and while we were quick to jump on and say, great, you know, we're happy to see the, the end of the province we were able to create, um, we won't say too much that, you know, over half of them went to SNC level N. But, but it did bring jobs into the province, and it did bring workers into the province, and, and that probably helped their tourism industry just a little. Um, but but the, the, the slight of hand here happens in what we're calling the wells. So there's an abandoned well, and this is a well that um, is not being used. It may not be owned by a company. That company may have gone bankrupt. But it's an otherwise productive well. Um, it, it can be put back onto production. Its leases are paid, and its taxes and royalties are paid. Okay, so, you know, this is possibly a future asset is the way I would consider that. But these are the ones we're abandoning. Now, there's another kind of well that we call an orphan well. Now, orphan wells, like abandoned wells, also don't have an owner anymore. And they've lapsed now in their royalties and their taxes, and they are in arrears. So now they are costing money, which would you would think would be the more likely well to abandon and dis, uh, decommission. But those aren't the ones we're decommissioning. In fact, it's it's... It's active oil field. It's active energy assets that we are abandoning. Um, I don't think any any single job um, is worth that. Um, it's it's the wrong direction, and our, our provincial government supported it wholeheartedly. Um, I believe the NDP supported it wholeheartedly too. They've supported the Scott Moe government all through the the restrictions and the state of emergency. They've supported a state of emergency for well past the 30 days. It hasn't gone in front of a court. We're six months into a state of emergency in this province, unprecedented in our history. Uh, they've supported them the whole way. So if you're not with Mo, the only way to go is Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Nice way to it. Convenient. Yeah, now, the COVID thing is interesting there with the state of emergency. Uh, what would the Buffalo Party want to do in terms of handling that. Uh, I don't even know if I want to call it a crisis, frankly, but with the pandemic, to speak to that if you would. Yeah, sure. Well, the last time I checked, actually, I believe the pandemic um, through the WHO has been downgraded to an epidemic, but we, and, and the media here still uses the phrase pandemic. So let's be accurate and we'll continue calling it pandemic. Um, COVID-19 is a real thing. Um, and, and a Buffalo Party government, first and foremost, would always put the, the safety and well-being of Saskatchewan citizens first. Um, I think when when COVID first happened, we, we didn't have a lot of data. We didn't know much about the China virus. It, it was foreign to us and it was coming in from elsewhere. Um, so we had to err on the side of caution. The federal government did. I, I would support that. The, the provincial government, that's prudent governance. Um, at some point here, we, we need to look at metrics, and and the metrics slid a little bit. We were flattening the curve, which actually means limiting the rate of infection, so that that, that makes sense. Limiting the rate of infection is the only way to, to battle a pandemic. But that changed, and suddenly it was zero cases of COVID. The only thing acceptable would be zero cases. And of course, this is the type of virus, like a cold, um, that spreads like a cold, and it's very easily, and, and it's going to cycle. It's probably going to cycle every year. That's a fact. It's probably going to cycle for years to come. That's a fact. We may, we may not get a virus that's widely effective. That's a fact. Um, so what we really need to do is strive to keep that infection rate in a in a, in a rate that's handleable by our by our healthcare system. So so to that end, we recognize that our primary healthcare system has the resources it has. We need to work within them. Um, and we understand that the, the opinion of the chief medical health officer is they're good opinions. We are not attacking Dr. Shahab in any way. What we're saying is, is what he's saying is one metric. There's other metrics that we need to look at. And so uh, one of those metrics is actually hospitalizations. The, this is the only metric that really tells us how overwhelmed our health care system is. And, and this is where the government is losing the people of Saskatchewan. We are suffering restrictions to this day because our health system may become overwhelmed, and yet it's it's hardly been used at all. And so it's it's a real knock to the credibility of what the government is saying. Um, that's dangerous. It's dangerous for governments to do that. And so um, a, a Buffalo Party government would lift the state of emergency right away based on the current numbers. Um, I was asked about a second wave, if a second wave happened. Well, if the first wave happens and we get to a second wave, 
um, absolutely, again, a threshold is going to have to be established of how many hospitalizations are acceptable. It's not how many cases are acceptable. We need to stop speaking like that. And we need to call government on it. If, if they're speaking in those terms, they're looking for an emotional effect. They aren't looking for an actual metric effect. And, and that's what we need to call them on. So in my opinion, with our current number of hospitalizations, we should be looking up to open up sectors, open up sectors entirely, and then evaluate how many hospitalizations have occurred as a result. If that's an acceptable number, and I don't mean zero, if it's an acceptable number, we need to look at the next industry and the next industry, because what we're witnessing is the, the hugest handover of market share from local business to multinational business that we've ever seen in our lifetime. And so if you are supporting continued restrictions in the name of security, you have to understand that you are also supporting the transfer of wealth from Main Street to Bay Street. And that doesn't benefit Saskatchewan or Saskatchewan people at all. Yes, and even to Wall Street or Seattle, Amazon had its best quarter ever, despite all the measures they took to spend on personal protective equipment and that they still had billions of profit. So Jeff Bezos is laughing, and of course he owns the Washington Post, and I think the New York Times as well. Convenient. What are you hearing at the doors, Richard, when you're talking to people about your party? Right. Well, the first question I always get is on separation, and we, we sort of touched on that. It's separation of necessarily necessary, but not necessarily secession. And, and that is to say, we we have a lot of interesting um, um, challenges that we would like to address. That's coming out in our platform next week. We as a party will le release the platform in its entirety so that voters have the most amount of time to interact with that and get to know the party. Um, and, and we understand that um, we are running candidates in about a dozen ridings. There's a reason for that. Um, those are all credible candidates that have been vetted by the, the board of directors and the nomination committee. Um, they're all real candidates. There are no paper candidates in this party. And we are presenting ourselves to Saskatchewan as a credible opposition to the government. Uh, we are not going to put enough MLAs into the legislature to govern. Um, but on the other hand, we can get enough in so that our voice can be heard, the, the voice of Saskatchewan people, the one that the government glazes over. You know, once you're governing, you, you, you have to try and govern for everybody. And that means somebody always has to be glazed over. Um, when, when you are a new movement, you can really, really get in touch with the grassroots. And that's where we're at. We are literally taking these ideas to the people, to their doors, and asking them what they think. Once we get past that conversation, Lee, people really want to talk about the economy. This isn't an election like any other, and Scott Mull rightly goes to the economy as the election question. Um, but I think he's going to be surprised that our representation in the Federation is a lot bigger issue this election than he thinks. Now, the economy, we would like to see the economy open. We would like to see it growing again. And that's not going to happen in this province until new money starts to come in again. So if we're going to keep tourists shut down, if we are going to keep hunting shut down, if we... It's not going to work. We're not going to have a sustainable economy. So we need to talk to the government about that. But they don't even want to recognize that there's restrictions. Oh, it, it is what it is. Dr. Shahab will come out and tell you what the recommendations are. Well, it's not Premier Shahab. It's Premier Mo. Dr. Shahab is the advisor. And, and Premier Mo makes the decisions. So I would like it to be known that our government is choosing our current fate. And it could choose... A different one and we would like to be the opposition in Regina so that we can ask them simply why not so uh, how's it been in terms of fundraising of getting volunteers I know when I ran for the People's Party I, I was up against a lot of that I found out recently that there are more conservative memberships in the riding of Cypress Hills grasslands I think it's the fifth most in the entire country and part of that was because of the leadership race that happened there to fill the uh, vacancy, vacancy of David Anderson, who'd been there for 19 years. So you have the advantage of running in a riding where there's a clean slate. Larry Doak is not running again. And even the second place person is not running for the NDP. You really don't have to worry about a vote split there, although that's gonna be in people's heads because I encountered it. I told people you could split that vote four ways and still have more than the Liberals. 
So, but it, it, I found that people were really clinging to fear and just a desire to get rid of Trudeau, and that in the end, the media defined in many people's minds what the People's Party was and was not. And then if they were going to vote or thinking about voting them after talking to me, I wonder just how often their friends and family talked them out of it. So I'm just very interested as someone who had been involved with the federal conservatives and is now with a party that is openly with Western independence, uh, what that's been like for relationships and, and how that goes over at the door as well for people who've been traditional SAS party supporters. Right. So yeah, definitely some of my, some of my SAS party friends and some of my federal friends were surprised. Um, I've given up my my membership to both of those parties. I'm only a member of the Buffalo Party now. Um, these are my convictions, and I'm I'm willing to stand by them. So to that end, I've actually been extremely surprised at the reaction at the door, and and even by telephone, um, I've had people calling me. Um, they want to donate. They want a sign. Um, they want to support the party publicly. And I was sort of expecting that that same reaction that that Maxime and and you and the the People's Party got, but. That election was very polarized. It was very red and blue. And unfortunately, the purple of the PPC kind of blended in there somewhere and, and kind of got lost in the mix. In this case, um, we've got the SAS party. And, and in my riding, uh, they won that with nearly 65% or 70% of the vote. I think it might have even been higher. And, and every riding that we're in is exactly that case. We are not running in Batash. We are not running in Saskatoon. We are not running in Regina. We are not running in the north. Uh, Joel Vermet um, won't, won't have a Buffalo Party candidate uh, run against them. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And it's exactly what you said. We are pitching ourselves as a credible opposition, not just a disruptor. And we really feel like the support for NDP is at an all-time low, um, that Brian Miley doesn't really connect with Saskatchewan voters. Yegmeet Singh certainly doesn't. Uh, propping up the Liberal government is is the worst way to make friends in Saskatchewan right now. So they've got a lot of challenges that way. So that's the case. Um, in the ridings we're running in, it's either going to be us or the SAS party. Um, we're not letting the NDP into the legislature anywhere. And that's exactly why we're running the candidates in the ridings that we are. They, the candidates we have are all well vetted. They're credible people. They're confident people. They're competent people. They've been competent in their own lives. And they're passionate about this. They're passionate about getting a fair deal for Saskatchewan. That's going to be the name of our campaign and our platform, a fair deal for Saskatchewan. This is not a radical party. In, and our views on COVID are not radical either. We are not talking about anything other than going to a restaurant with your family and sitting at the same table. We are not talking about anything beyond stopping at the store on the way home from work with the kids because you picked them up from school. We are talking about regular everyday life and that's not radical um somehow in the mix it's become that and it's not true and saskatchewan people are frustrated with that and i think that that is going to be the the issue that um that galvanizes this this election mm -hmm. uh anything else that you'd like to say as we wrap up uh, no, I, I really feel like we've gotten the chance to introduce the Buffalo Party to to some people in Saskatchewan. Uh, hopefully they will check the Buffalo Party out, check out Wade Sierra, the leader. Uh, give him a call. He's a fantastic guy. He's on his phone all day, and he's never too busy to talk to people of Saskatchewan. If you've got questions about what independence within the Confederation mean, call one of us, please. By all means, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us um, uh, by the, the uh, website, www buffalopartysk.com and, and and talk to us. That's what we're trying to do this election. We're really, really trying to, to introduce people to what we're saying. Well, I sure appreciate well, I sure the appreciate opportunity that. to speak with you today and mm -hmm. I look forward Thanks to for whenever it happens next. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Lee. Have a great day. All right, you as well.